Hello, sweet people. I think it's just about time. I'm ready if you are. Uh, while you're getting settled, be sure you silence your phone. And we may have a few people still coming in, but let's let's get started so we have as much time for what matters as we we can get. So, um, welcome to Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Exhibitions. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education. I don't think that was Freudian. I've been doing this job a long time and I like it. I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you here tonight for Tuesday Evenings. I think most of you uh, know that Tuesday Evenings is um, a public program that I'm so proud to say is free and um, open to all. Um, it happens each spring and each fall, and we're well into our spring um, 2022 um, season. Next week, um, the Dallas-based artist um, and cultural innovators, I think is an appropriate way to describe them, Tamara Johnson and Trey Burns are here to um, share ideas and um, the impetus of uh, both their joint and individual practices. And it will be great. Um, I think some of you maybe know uh, Tamara and Trey, and if you don't, do, do a quick Google search. You'll be um, intrigued, and I think you'll be back next week. Bring a friend. Um, tonight, we are so fortunate to have the artist Jamal Cyrus with us, um, and our fortune is doubled in that um, Jamal is here in conjunction with Focus Jamal Cyrus, which opens to the public this coming Friday. So um, you're getting a bit of a sneak peek, at least into um, his larger practice, which will, I think, inform your experience of the Focus show. Um, with a BFA from the University of Houston and an MFA from the University of Pennsylvania, um, Jamal Cyrus currently lives and works in Houston, which is also the city of his birth. Um, as a significant member of its active art community, Jamal's influence is felt throughout Houston and beyond. As he is a mentor to other artists and students who regularly encounter his multidisciplinary art that spans the spectrum from textiles and drawings to sculptures to sound to performance and more. And as an occasional curator, um, a professor of art at Texas Southern University, and a former member of the revolutionary collective um, Otabanga uh, Jones and Associates. With his research-based practice, Jamal has stated, quote, I see my work as um, a form of self-education. Due to the illegality of um, teaching the enslaved to read and write and the subsequent lack of access to education following emancipation and well into the middle of the 20th century, the action of teaching oneself has, lo has a long history within black culture, which I think is beautiful and um, devastating. Um, it is, of course, no surprise that such commitment has um, been recognized with an impressive exhibition record, including the 2006 Whitney Biennial and other group exhibitions at the New Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the MCA in Chicago, as well as the much acclaimed 2020 CAM exhibition in Houston titled Slowed and Throwed Records of the City Through uh, Mutilated, I'm sorry, Mutated Lenses. Um, and the current This Tender, Fragile Thing at Jack Shaneman Gallery in uh, Kinderhook, New York, as well as solo exhibitions such as last year's career, um, career survey, The End of My Beginning at the Blaffer Gallery in Houston, which has traveled and is now um, on view at the ICA in LA as well as recognition with awards such as the 2020 Driscoll Prize awarded by the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. There is much more to report, but I'll conclude with the fact that I find myself taken with Jamal Cyrus's contributions to important conversations, his sources and his choices as an artist, and I know that that is the case for many of you, so if you would, please join me in a warm welcome for Jamal Cyrus.
Thank you very much, Terry, for that warm introduction, and thank you all for coming out this evening uh, to, as she said, to um, find out a little bit more about uh, just my, my, my work in general. Tonight, I'll be speaking in particularly, or uh, specifically about the role of music or well, sound and music in my work, right, as a, as a, as an inspiration, um, primarily as inspiration, because I, I'm not a musician. Um, I do work with sound every once in a while, but mainly I use it um, as, as a mode of thinking, right, and, and try to, to um, create visual works based off of this, this kind of long, you know, tradition, uh, history of, of, of American musicians and uh, specifically within, you know, the context of black America. So, um, so I start off with this, with this quote here. I forgot the laptop screen here because <laughs> we would have been in trouble. Okay, so it says that there are definite stages in the Negro's transmutation from African to American, or at least there are certain very apparent changes in the Negro's reactions to America from the time of his importation as a slave until the present. That can, I think, be seen. And again, I insist that these changes are most graphic in his music. Leroy Jones uh, from uh, his, his very important work, Blues People. Um, and so the idea is that um, Black American history can be can be traced through through sound, right? So music is not only uh, a commodity, but it's a historical document, right? And that's one of the the things which is which is most um, interesting uh, about Black American music is its functionality, right? And that's what I try to to um, pull out through my work, um, as, as we'll see. So one of the things also uh, that led me to this point um, is that I come from a family of musicians, um, particularly gospel musicians. And one of the things, so this is my uncle here, V. Michael McKay. My mother is there on the stairs back there. My aunt is back there on the stairs, as well as kind of like a you know, a group of, of family, longtime family friends. Um, the thing about gospel music or the thing about sacred music um, is again, it, 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 for many time, for many years, you know, gospel music pushed against its, its kind of, uh, the nature of the commodity, right? It was, it was used to transcend and was used to, you know, pull people, yeah, out of, out of the, their everyday situations, right? And so that's, you know, seeing that as a as a young person, really, really growing up with that, kind of um, yeah, I believe just caused me to see uh, music in the in a different way, or to expect something else from it other than entertainment. So this is a piece uh, which is called Sargasso Sea. Uh, this is a, a remake of of the sculpture. And I'm not, going, I'm not going chronologically, right? I'm kind of going uh, back and forth a little bit. But I decided to start here because um, there, is a, there is a theory um, that black American music, or well, I'm going to speak specifically to black American music, starts within the, the, the journey, which is called the Middle Passage, right? And the idea that, you know, this was the first time that some of these people were, were together in a really a very extreme environment. And we know um, just because how music is used um, socially and kind of as well as to, to console, um, as well as for other reasons, you know, there, uh, Sadia Hardman traces that music was, performance also took place on the on the on on, on slave ships right for for the entertainment of those who worked on the slave ships so music again from the beginning is is occurring on all these having all these different phases to the, to it so I, I wanted to start here so we can kind of kind of set up a, a a point of origin right from from where we could potentially uh, understand 
kind of what we're dealing with, what we talk about American, black American music. So this piece, just to, to say a little bit about the, the elements of it, um, it has a triangular pedestal with these repeated uh, kind of concentric triangles, which refers to the, you know, the triangular trade or the importation of people and goods from the west coast of Africa to the quote unquote new world to Europe and then, and then back again. Um, the materials on this uh, are a hi-hat stand, um, which holds the symbol and, and the brain coral. And then below the brain coral, I'm sorry, below the, the hi-hat stand is this material called sargassum, uh, or sargassum weed, which, which uh, washes up onto the beaches of the Caribbean, right? And washes onto the beaches of Galveston Island, right? Which is, as, as you all know, the Gulf of Mexico, but which is really also could be, could be named the Northern Caribbean, perhaps. Um, and so the, the material sargassum is interesting to me because one, it, uh, because of where it comes from, you know, the Sargasso Sea is kind of like this area which is in the middle of, of the Triangular Trade Territory, but also because once it, it dries, once it goes from a seaweed to this dry material on, on the beach, it starts to look like black hair, right? I'm not sure if any of you all have seen it, but it starts to take on the texture of black hair. And so <clears throat> hair was a material which I used early on in my work, and so um, I wanted to continue, continue that, but in a, in a, in a kind of translated uh, uh, or transposed way. So just to show you a little bit again about the triangular trade. And this is a piece called uh, Untitled Grand Verbalizer, What Time Is It? And um, it's a, a drum, a bass drum in particular, which was uh, wrapped in, in black leather um, and then covered, surrounded by all these, with all these microphones. And I made this in, in 2010 at Art Pace, um, and it, it was really uh, my finding information or getting information about uh, drum languages. And as, as Terry was saying, I often use my, my work as kind of a, a process in my own education about, about you know, these histories, which I am unaware of for one reason or the other. Um, and I really, you know, try to, to um, translate these moments in history into, into visual form in an artistic manner, not in a kind of a didactic, well, sometimes didactic, but not in a, not in a representational manner, but, but translate them into visual form as well as synthesize them, okay? So sometimes within these, these works, there, there are several moments that I'm, that I'm connecting um, either just, you know, out of inquiry or kind of curiosity, but also kind of um, on the level of imagination. And this was, um, as I said, a piece which is the bass drum. And just to say a little bit of, of, about, you know, which is the drum that moves the body, right? Um, and just to say a little bit about drum languages, um, within West Africa, there are different... Um, ideas about how these drum languages operate. And within, within uh, so within kind of West African art, you know, there are these kind of levels of, these levels of, of knowing and, and uh, initiation. And some people say that uh, drum languages are, are simply signals, right? Some people say drum languages are, um, Basically, they, they mimic, they're played to mimic the, the human voice. And if you think about the talking drum and, and, and the, the manipulation of the talking drum and, and tone, and that, that makes sense. But also, uh, some people say that there is a drum language on its own, you know, entirely that, that's known by master musicians. So this is, you know, this is a piece of me thinking about, um, you know, about the drum as an orator, as a speaker. You know, hence the idea of grand verbalizer. Um, in terms of the arrangement of, of, of the piece, I'm, I'm thinking about a couple of different things or kind of working, collaging a couple of different things. One is just how, how drums are mic'd in the studio. 
Um, and then the other one is uh, images that I had seen from activists of the late 60s, early 70s at these different press conferences, right, that are surrounded by all of these microphones, you know. Um, and thinking about that image, thinking about surveillance, thinking about, you know, the sound bite. And then just thinking about like the oral tradition as well, right? And so, um, so these are the things which which are 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 in this are in this work, um, you know. And there's a side a side note, which is, uh, you know, if you look into uh, to antebellum history, the 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 drum was only really allowed to be practiced in in one place, um, as far as I'm aware which was in Congo Square in New Orleans on, on one day a week, right? And so that, that also takes on a, a very important part. So the drum was essentially outlawed in most of the South. So this gets to, okay, so now I'm kind of kind of changing lanes a little bit. And um, this gets to be more of a, a personal project that uh, I worked on for around 16 years, very slowly, um, but this is about a, uh, a small record label, which is called Pride Records. Okay, so I'm kind of getting ready to go into that. But before I, I do, I, I'll, I'll just say like these, this is the, these are some of the groups that were, were influential to the musicians that I grew up on. So artists and poets from the black, black arts movement, black liberation movement, were very uh, influential uh, to people to artists within the, because some of them were, you know, kind of their, their children, uh, the kind of group of, of hip-hop artists that I grew up with in the late 80s and early 90s. And, you know, my story um, in terms of how I came to do this work, or my story in terms of, you know, music educating me is really, I, I think, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to, to share with others, right, in terms of... Uh, in terms of the, the, the functionality of music um, within American culture and again specifically within black American culture. So Public Enemy, Queen Latifah, you know, these are very kind of Afrocentric uh, uh, artists that, you know, were coming with the content but also were coming with this, with this form, like this, this sonic form that was so intriguing and so revolutionary at the time. So it was kind of like a, a double kind of whammy for people. So, um, so those, you know, and the thing is that I, I saw that, that moment um, in the late 80s, early 90s kind of turn into something very different. And, you know, that started me thinking about, um, about uh, COINTELPRO. So at the time that I was listening to these things and kind of getting this information, I'm also kind of trying to, to learn that more about the um, America of the late 60s, early 70s, uh, particularly, you know, with the, what happened to black, black America in that, that moment um, in terms of its, its kind of revolutionary thrust or its um, activist thrust. And one of the important factors was this thing, was this FBI kind of um, program called COINTELPRO or Counterintelligence Program. And what I did um, is to create um, a small record label. Uh, this is this is fictional. Small record label, which is uh, which comes into being after the Detroit Rebellion of 1967. And because of their uh, effectiveness in reaching their market, their target market, they also become uh, a target uh, of COINTELPRO. And again, essentially, they're they're a record label. And they become, you know, the words that are used in these memorandums are, is neutralized. And they, they become neutralized not necessarily through, through physical violence, but through a kind of economic violence, right? So it, the FBI makes it difficult for them to, uh, to distribute their music. And eventually, because of that, they have to be bought out by a larger kind of parent company. And then that parent company changes their program, you know, and, and so... That's kind of the trajectory of, of Pride Records. Um, what I did was, because this was just, you know, it was a hunch that I had that, you know, cultural organizations would also have been kind of um, approached, you know, or seen as part of this, this kind of revolutionary movement. 
but I didn't really have any models yet. So what I did was kind of use the the life and death of the Black Panther Party as 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 my kind of model for for talking about pride. And what the work is essentially are three different sculptures that all refer to different forms of record store and book display. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, but here's one which is called Pride Record Findings Tokyo. And the, the series is, are 20 records. They're record covers. There's no sound. I don't make any sound or, or produce any sound with this. All the sound is ideally played out in the mind of the viewer. Right, so I, I kind of I um, lead, I try to lead the, the viewer through image and text to create a certain sound in their in their minds. And just to go back, this is a long quote, but I would I would like to read it. <clears throat> African American music has frequently been sent out into the world in open, provisional formats, which anticipate the supplementary work that active consumers must bring to the ritual setting in which it will be played, if it is to reveal its full power. This argument can be extended beyond the specifically musical dimension of the record as a cultural commodity. Parallel and essentially similar processes of aesthetic and political grounding can be shown to be at work in the invitation to read and make active use of images and texts on record sleeves. In order to appreciate the significance of the imagery of race that record sleeves project, it is essential to remember that we are dealing with a dispossessed and economically exported population which does not enjoy extensive opportunities to perceive itself or see its experiences imaginatively or artistically reflected in the visual culture of, the, of urban living uh, by Paul Giroy in his book Small Acts. So again, just thinking about the record, comfort, the record cover as this, this place of opportunity which um, which is not always kind of, which is not meted out equally, right? And this is one, um, so Pride Freeze, Jerry White's record shop, Central Avenue, Los Angeles. <coughs> and this is Pride Record sighting at the Gary Convention of 1972. So interestingly enough, also um, bookstores, were, were also targets of, of COINTELPRO. And so each of the covers, you know, tells, tells a, a very particular history, and as I said, goes from kind of very kind of politically radical sentiments to, to, to being uh, uh, centered on or, or, or part of the, the disco movement at the time. And for the disco lovers, I, I like disco as well. But the, <laughs> the thing about um, about that time, politics were, 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 not, were not a part of that discussion in terms of the production of the music. And it was primarily about the body. But you could say, well, you know, the party is the place of revolution. But anyway, we could, that's an <laughs> argument. Um, but each of these has very uh, particular histories, again, that I'm finding out as I'm going along. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, this, this series took so long. Uh, this is a group called Sharonda and the Blackstone Queens, Me, My Shining Prince in the Deep Black Sea, Extended Play 45, Pride Catalog 1042. So she, you know, this is the, of course, the, uh, a diagram from, from the back of the, the, the airplane about what happens if you crash. You know, she's in this ocean. Uh, and holding on to the autobiography of, of Malcolm X. Uh, the Blackstone Queens is a reference to a Chicago street gang called the Blackstone Rangers that were going through a process of politic politicization in the late, late 60s, early 70s. Unfortunately, still doing some criminal activity, though. This is a uh, LP from a group called the Dowling Street Martyr Brigade. Uh, the name is Towards a Walk in the Sun, Pride Catalog number 2235. Um, so this is from the, the Tokyo, Pride Record Finance Tokyo, uh, which has the katakana uh, translation in the, in the, on the label there. You know, thinking about the, the global nature of black music, again, as a, as a commodity and as a, um, 
like a, as, a, as a cultural model, I would say also. Uh, Dallas Street Martyr was this gentleman named Carl Hampton who was uh, assassinated by uh, the Houston police, I believe this is 1970. Was trying to create a, a kind of splinter group of the Black Panther Party called the People's Party II. Um, even after his death, the, uh, the organization continued to, to operate, but you know, was ne and they were trying to set up this, this clinic in honor of his name, a free clinic on Dowling Street, but were never really able to get it off the ground due to manipulation and an outside influence. So this is a video um, which I, I find much later, um, probably like, I don't know, at least halfway, you know, into my time uh, of, of doing the, uh, the Pride record series. Um, and this is about a gentleman named, named Dothard Perry. And he's going to talk about his, his work as an informant and also going to talk about his work as an as a infiltrator of black cultural organizations. You also were active in the infiltration of uh, many cultural groups. Before we go into that step by step, how much research and study did the FBI engage in of black culture in the late 60s? A great amount. Give me an idea. Uh, but the thing is, I, I, I can, uh, they have a problem on every type of magazine. Uh, the blacks read, they have a file on, on, on the music. Music? Music, dance, theater, uh, actors, comedians, you name it, man. And they would actually study these? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes, definitely. What would they do with music? Uh, to understand the people, you have to understand the culture. To infiltrate, you have to understand. You had a lot of so-called white liberals that were infiltrating the so-called uh, black groups using the uh, information that they had gathered from the studies of blacks. Uh, you mean just to understand the behavior pattern of our people? Oh, yeah, I can, uh, you know, Will Eaton can name out some jams and Miles Davis that I hadn't even heard of. He can name off some, some books that I hadn't even read pertaining to black culture. Do you ever see agents actually studying oh, yes. music? Of yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I've seen them going over uh, even video portion of cultural events. Uh, the understanding, like when, okay, you have an organization like uh, uh, Leroy Jones Black Ops, you remember that? Okay, Leroy Jones' place, which was done on the uh, thing of tribalism. I, I, that's where I first heard the word kintu, mantu, hantu, hantu, these, these words, uh, the African continuum. I, you know, I, I learned that from an agent. He ran it down to me. They make in-depth, in-depth studies of the person. Okay. So again, that, that came to me, uh, you know, much later, but, um, yeah, I mean it. it it's interest. It's an interesting thing about about working as an artist, and I think like following a hunch, how the hunches can lead you to places you know that 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 are true. So um, that was Delphic Perry. So that's kind of one one way you know in terms of sound as as in music as like this this document, uh, this historical document. Um, you know, this is a very different piece. Uh, this is a work called Texas Fried Tenor. And uh, Texas Fried Tenor is essentially about um, a group of, of, of tenor saxophonists from different parts of Texas that, are, that were known to have a particular sound, right? A particular quality of sound, right? A particular kind of like fullness and kind of soulfulness or earthiness. Um, 
and and this is a it's a it's a uh, kind of a a live uh, it's a performance that ends in making the sculpture and the making of a sculpture also yields a, 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 a has a sound element to it and it also has a ritualistic element to it as well so this is after the I think this is right before the horn is getting ready to get get fried, and it's kind of I'm blowing blowing smoke onto it, sage. Uh, this is the uh, the work in the installation view, Texas fried tinner. Um, so the, the once the sculpture is ready, I put it on these two railroad ties. Right, and uh, well, this railroad tie that has been cut in half, and then it, the pedestal is made from that. Um, I there's a lot. So for me, uh, within within blues imagery, there there's a lot of uh, evoking of trains. You know, whether you know it be sonically, you know, rhythmically, or you know the way people kind of use their voice sometimes. Or you know, even talking about you know travel, you know, um, there, there's a lot of train imagery. So I, I, I use that in, in my in my work, my sculpture work. Upstairs, you, you all haven't seen it, but also uses um, elements from a train, two railroad ties, and then one uh, rail. And this Texas Fried Tender is funny because I, I think um, a lot of my um, Work is, is made through collage, and I, I think, you know, because of the, the time period that I grew up in, you know, in terms of the music I listened to, like, th I just started to kind of have this, this normal collage sensibility. And um, so this is a work, uh, what is Splash, by Richard Serra, where he's throwing uh, kind of lead, throwing lead into the corner and, and making these casts of these corners. Of, of his studio or these other workspaces. And this piece was about his father's, you know, working in the, the steel mills, you know. And similarly, Texas Fried Tenor was about my father when he was an undergrad. You know, he would go up to, to New Jersey and he would work at these country clubs as a short order cook, right? So thinking about just like these personal histories of, of labor you know, and kind of um, aesthetics that are that are I think associated with them. If you, you know, you probably wouldn't think about it if you're if you're in the kitchen for eight hours a day. But you know, I can think about that as 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 an artist. Um, so was really struck by this by this work by seeing this work. One was the performative nature of it, um, and you know, I really feel like performance is one of those things that. Um, Black America has really contributed in in regards to the to creativity and uh, you know creative disciplines, and so I, I try to try to tap into that into that energy. So I wanted to take this Richard Serra piece and then translate it into my own experience. Uh, another element of this piece is this uh, song, which is called Deacon Blues. I'm not sure if you all know, know the song Deacon Blues, but um, the refrain in it says, I'll learn to work the saxophone and I'll play just what I feel, right? And it really, it, it's, a, it's a blues story and it's a tragic, tragic story that's within uh, Deacon Blues, but it was one of the first times I started to think about, um, well, when it was laid clear to me that the saxophone has been used within, within uh, Black American culture as, as this, uh, again, transcended or transformative uh, instrument. And so I wanted to, to also utilize it for, for tapping into it for, for that reason. And so Texas Fried Tenor is really part of a larger series called Learning to Work the Saxophone, in which I take different musicians' approach to the instrument and try to create performance or sculpture or, you know, some 2D work based off of that. So this is a work which is called Remembrance for H. Freeman. And um, so there's a story for, you know, people who, who, know, who know jazz. Um, there is a, 
a story that John Coltrane originally, and it's apocryphal, but I thought it was really, um, I thought it was a, it was an interesting story. And there's there's enough around it to 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 make it plausible. Um, and the idea is that John Coltrane originally wanted to call um, a love supreme Allah supreme, A L L A H, Allah as in God. And um, because of things that were happening in the Middle East at that time, uh, Impulse said, no, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to call it the Love Supreme. I'm sorry, Allah Supreme. And instead it comes to, uh, to a, a Love Supreme. Now, if you read the liner notes, um, there are definitely uh, Islamic principles that are part of the, the liner notes of this record. If you think about the form of the first song, where there's this chant, um, which you know, which in which in Sufi Islam is called a dhikr uh, or remembrance. There's a there's, it has this repeated kind of uh, naming or repetition of usually one of God's names or attributes. Um, and the city, the before he had, had married um, Alice Coltrane, he was married to a, a Muslim woman. So there, and, and people in this band also had accepted uh, Islam, namely McCoy Tyner. So there's, there's a lot which is, which is around um, this, this uh, apocryphal story. But what gave me this idea um, was finding out, and so it's kind of set up as this altarpiece, so the record is roughly five feet by five feet, has this, uh, it's on a, a, a low shelf, has this uh, red or kind of orange neon light behind it and what I did was take a love supreme and then I had it translated into Arabic um, I have a gentleman who um, was a graphic Egyptian graphic designer who who, who created a, a Arabic typeface very similar to the to the impulse to the original impulse typeface and another thing behind this there there are two other pieces of history so Thinking again about uh, trying to synthesize different moments is that uh, there is a church in the Bay Area that recognizes John Coltrane as a saint and utilizes elements of a love supreme um, in its, its uh, ritual service or its worship service. So that was, that was one of them. And the other, other side of that is there is a woman... Um, uh, who was, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of her name. She's a Senegalese historian who was starting to write about um, the history of, of American music. And she starts with the idea that the, uh, her last name is, oh gosh, okay, don't worry about it. But she starts with the idea that because of the drum, because the drum is outlawed, what then uh, types of then what instruments were were kind of utilized and it was primarily stringed instruments, right? So if you think about the banjo, uh, you think about the fiddle, the, the guitar, like these are these were the types of instruments that were allowed and also kind of encouraged. Um, if people have seen Twelve Years a Slave, you know that uh, slaves who had musical capabilities were uh, were basically leased out to other plantations and okay so. So there's that, and the thing is that many of the enslaved people who, who had um, a history with, with stringed instruments were primarily those from kind of uh, African Islamic uh, areas within West Africa. So the idea that at the, at the base of this, this music, um, the tonal base of the blues, there, there may be this, this kind of uh, African Islamic uh, influence. So that was part of the reason of, of translating and, you know, as well, uh, doing the translation into, into Arabic. So this is um, getting to be the, the end where I'm, I'm talking about what I'm working on for the, the Fort Worth show. And um, this is a piece called River Bends the Gulf Double Time. And this was part of the exhibition Prospect 5 in New Orleans. And what I started to, to think about um, with that, um, so as you see from, from Texas Fried Tenor, I've, I've, for, for a little while I've been interested in kind of like 
what is what are the reasons well reg regional kind of aesthetics right um and so doing this this work or being a part of this exhibition in uh in in new orleans gave me the example or the opportunity to really kind of think about uh think about that on a larger level and i started to come up with this idea around the sonic territory the term itself is not mine but the idea um that uh, different aspects, whether it be uh, geography, cultural interaction, you know, um, landscape, you know, wildlife, um, you know, rivers, the, all of these things potentially um, influence the sonic um, uh, attitude or, or character of a, of a particular place, right? And so this is something that I'm, that I'm just starting to, to try to work out work out for myself um, and I've kind of taken that idea and applied it to this the area that we're in the Dallas Fort Worth area which around the uh, Trinity River Basin you know you have all of these amazing musicians uh, who came out of this this area um, but the first work is is one of uh, I've been doing these denim pieces for a few years now um, they, they refer to, to documents, sometimes maps, sometimes FBI memorandums, but they also, through material and process, refer to, uh, refer to quilts. Um, they're made out of stripped jeans that are then uh, glued back together to, to, to create the composition. Um, I originally was, was attracted to this based off a of photograph I had seen of an of a activist group working in the in, in the South, in Mississippi in particular, um, because of the long kind of journeys that they were taking every day, uh, they started to wear blue jeans, you know, dungarees instead of uh, suits and dresses. And it was something that in my mind that I tied, you know, it, together in regards to this politic to, to, uh, to this material. And so that was, you know, the part of an impetus of it. Uh, later on, I saw in person one of the uh, G's Ben work clothes quilts. I'm not sure if you all have seen those, but in, in real life, you can, you can see all of these almost non-functional kind of stitches that, that run through them. Um, and line is, is really a, a, a factor in my work, a reoccurring factor in my work. And so I was really, I was very blown away by that experience of seeing that thing in, in real life. And, that caused me to want to put together these these works, and so um, as I started to to do them and find out more about the material, you know, it also leads me to to learn about uh, indigo, the indigo plant, um, as well as the the role of denim as a as a quote unquote Negro cloth, right? Um, as as in one of those cloths that were kind of categorically you, you know utilized or reserved for uh for enslaved peoples and later you know working class peoples in the united states so um so yeah river bends to gulf and i think yeah so just to say a little bit more um this is the gentleman who whose work I'm, I'm really trying to, to trying to base the the focus exhibition off of his name is julius Hempel. He's a Fort Worthian. Is that the sure. Fort Worthian? Okay. Um, went to I.M. Terrell High School, similar to Ornette Coleman, but is is it really is a force. Um, was a force. He died in the mid '90s. Um, was a force within um, American experimental music or uh, or free jazz. Um, and it's just a, it, it's very interesting in terms of the you know the lineage that comes out of this city you know in regards to its effect on on this particular kind of genre or or category of jazz music but uh julius hempel was a composer as well as a as a multi-reed player played you know various forms of saxophones is mostly known with for his work with uh a group called the world saxophone quartet in which he would compose these uh, these pieces strictly for for various uh, voices of saxophone, uh, but in his work had a very multidisciplinary approach. Um, would combine uh, 
music with theater, music with 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 dance, you know, uh, audio recordings with his live playing. Um, just really just a very exploratory musician and, and so the, the, you know his work uh, particularly a, a, a piece called Dogon AD is what I'm kind of you know trying to, to, to tap into or trying to use as an inspiration for for the uh, for the focus series or for the focus exhibition there's one other thing I want to say about about him oh his his use of uh, um, I guess what you would call um, avant-garde art in southern vernacular, right? Like his 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 his, his approach to balancing these two with, within his uh, within his work is is also very um, kind of inspirational to me. Um, in particular, a uh, piece. This is kind of what got me kind of going down this route. Is a piece that he he wrote called Ralph Ellison's Long Tongue. Right, in which he said this was a, a statement that <laughs> the long tongue is something he used to hear people and old people in Fort Worth say, right? And so, um, so yeah, I just find him to be a, a yeah, an incredible musician and artist. So I will stop there. Um, we do have some time for question and answer if anyone has any questions. Sound, yeah, this time sound is part of the exhibition. Yeah, and it's, it's something that, um, so again, as I said, I'm not a musician, but um, I found a person to collaborate with on this particular piece, and we've kind of, uh, we've put together this sound collage, utilizing um, some solo recordings we found of, of Mr. Hemphill, as well as some other uh, kind of field recordings we located. Anyone else? I have actually two questions. Um, mm -hmm. My first question is, um, did, you know, so you're interested in sound and you're interested in the in the, the viewer hearing the sound. Um, do, do, has it ever has it ever interested you to to start with literary works? You know, like Langston Hughes or mm -hmm. or Toni Morrison or Bell Hooks. I mean, whoever. Did, you know, because mm -hmm. so, because poetry is is mm -hmm. musical. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did that ever occur to you? I did. So especially with the with the record covers, um, as I was doing the, the the Pride record series, particularly in the um, the the early part, um, I was reading this this poetry uh, compilation called Black Fire. I don't know if you have ever heard of this, but it comes. It's it's, it's basically like the first uh, compilation of uh, Black arts movement poets uh, put together, compiled by uh, Amir Baraka and Larry Neal. And, uh, and so that was, that was what I was reading. So Towards the Walk in the Sun comes from the, the title of uh, Orline and, and this, this uh, poet, uh, oh gosh, it's really hard for me to say his name. He's a South African poet. He's actually the father of uh, Earl Sweatshirt. Does anybody know? Yeah, so um, a rapper named Earl Sweatshirt. But, uh, but yeah, but poetry was definitely an influence. My second question, I'm really fast, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So you were, um, you did your MFA at, at Penn, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, what was that mm -hmm. like? As a, what was this, in the 90s? Or two, or uh, it? Early 2000s, so 2006 to 2008. Okay, what, is, what was that like as an African American artist? At UPenn? Um, so I was in Philadelphia. Um, oddly enough, Philadelphia, for some reason, felt like Houston to me. It wasn't as big, but... <laughs> That may be weird to say, but it felt it felt like home, you know. And Philly also has this really rich kind of musical tradition, whether you talk about soul music or jazz, you know. So, um, so that that helped. But also, uh, the gentleman who I was studying with is, is this late sculptor Terry Atkins. So you know, um, so being at 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 UPenn and being in Philly was was really um, yeah, it was. It was great. It was a great experience. I'm glad I ended up there, actually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just jumping off of her question, when you were in Philadelphia, did you have kind of the same um, site-specific approach where you would kind of trace back the history mm -hmm. of the location? So that doesn't come, the, the site specific, specificity within the work doesn't come until later. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there was always a kind of 
uh, an interest in material, in particular materials and, and their kind of like evocative qualities. But um, in terms of, of sight in wanting to do things about, you know, regional kind of southern cultures in particular, that doesn't come till after graduate school. I think where I just kind of, I started to get, um, I started to have a different take on the idea of research, right? And, and, and it was open to, you know, not just reading about things, but just, you know, research is kind of me living in a place, hearing stories and, you know, just kind of soaking up the, the environment, you know. Um, so that, that comes a little bit later. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Anybody? Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the nature of um, what you call as self-educating um, mm -hmm. through your work or with your work? And um, like, was that an inclination that you then realized had some relationship to um, a historical fact mm -hmm. um, of education of African Americans in this country? Um, and or, did, you know, how, how did that come How did that come to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that's actually part of growing up in Texas, right? And we all know, I mean, still to this day, you know, um, history within public, Texas public schools is, is a political phenomenon, right? And I, I grew up with these, with these gaps and absences in my, my understanding of history that... My parents didn't really, my parents discussed to a degree, but didn't discuss in detail. And I think this has to deal with, partially with trauma, right? Um, but aside from that, you know, I'm getting all this information from, through these groups who are located in the Northeast, you know, primarily out in New York City. And I'm just trying to figure out like how to make sense of it, you know, like what they're talking about, you know, because, um, again, like the information was tied to this, this like really intriguing sonic material, right? And that I was just eating it up. And so I was really, yeah, trying to keep up and uh, with, with what was, was, was being said in the music. And I think that really led me on a, a path as an artist as well. Yeah. So that is still ongoing. I mean, I had been listening to Juvius Hemphill for a little while, but um, we located um, Julius Hemphill's archive, which is uh, at, at NYU, and there's been some information that we've gotten from them through video, and uh, the gentleman who, who, who kind of put that together is named Marty, Marty Ehrlichman, and has been helpful in terms of... Uh, you know, it's COVID, so you can't go in and visit, the, but has been helpful in terms of uh, sending information with textual and also video. So that's, that's primarily how I've been doing it. Yeah. Could you talk a little more about the impact of uh, music and the culture in New Orleans, and, or just about the work that you did in New Orleans a little more? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So New Orleans, um, again, you know, it was that place where um, enslaved and indigenous people were, were allowed to, to do traditional rituals and kind of practices one day a week in the afternoon, right? And it was, it was mandated or allowed by the Catholic Church, right, oddly enough. It took, took place in this place called Congo Square. And because, it, it, not only Congo Square, but had had a few other names and kind of was also in different places within uh, the city. But because of that, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it starts to color the, the, the musical culture of, of that city. You know, New Orleans music has, definitely has like a really specific kind of rhythmic character, you know, as well as like these um, families of musicians that, that start to, to, to develop within, within New Orleans, you know. Um, so it's really, it's just a very interesting place. And so that within that too, like there, you know, is the idea that, you know, music is kind of a, um, uh, so I guess I want to tell so. So uh, a friend of mine asked me for my grandmother's tea cake recipe, <laughs> which was a very famous, re you know, famous recipe. And I was kind of like, 
Really? Like, you don't know not to ask for somebody's recipe like that? You know, so it's a kind of family knowledge and information that stayed within the certain areas, right? And I think that can even be families, that could be neighborhoods, that could be the city as well, as well right? So, um, so, you know, the project in New Orleans led me to, to understand that um, as well as, you know, its place as a, as a um, point of origin for American music, you know, and just in general, right? And so, you know, New York, I'm sorry, New Orleans being one of the first really cosmopolitan, you know, places that has this really interesting racial history as well, you know, within the United States. So it's still... It's still, on, you know, evolving in terms of um, uh, my understanding of New Orleans. But I did this piece, and I did, which I, I didn't show, but I did uh, three drum sculptures that also, you know, are are reflections on on the Triangle of Trade and the uh, the Middle Passage as as a the, the the birthplace for Black American music, as well as the kind of um, hybridity which started to occur once you got to to uh, New Orleans. So those, that's the kind of territory I was in with that, you know, with those pieces. Yes. Um, I'm always interested, like, as someone in a gallery versus the kind of context and information that we're getting from you here about the pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, how much of that do you try to ensure is there for the average viewer to, to know, like, if I'm looking at that Sargasso C piece or yeah. something else, like, all these references and symbolism, you know, that's lost on the average viewer, I feel like, a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that goes along with any artist who is yeah. trying to utilize a level of abstraction, right? It was kind of overworking, you know. Um, but I would say, you know, my, my works, are, as I was kind of saying earlier, I, I try not to be... Um, kind of representational in a way of historically rep representational, but also to, to um, handle the works enough or to um, uh, attend to the works enough to where a formal, a formal quality comes out of them that's intriguing enough for you to kind of go to the next step, right? So, you know, titles, materials, you know, these are all kind of things which I kind of, I do utilize to give, kind of leave hints and kind of share information, you know, um, so that's the best I can say. Yeah, I, I mean, it is difficult, I understand, you know. Um, but I think this is, this is the kind of process that artists go through in order to make something. Some, you know, some artists go through in order to, to make something. You know, it's just like this layering and layering, and la you know, yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, I was going to ask about um, something about the drum because it, came off of that question, but now that she's asked that really, a really great question. Um, so there are other ways, obviously, to present ideas that are more um, packaged and complete. Mm -hmm. You've opted to be an artist. So what mm -hmm. is it about that, the, the kind of gaps and the filling in of the audience that intrigues you, that makes you want to make art versus, I don't know, write a story? You know? I'll be a document, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I think I am very intrigued by a tradition of, of artists and um, excited by the work that they made and um, inspired by that. And I want to I want to contribute to that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I think like that's in, you know, I, I don't know if a a documentary is as open or story is as uh, kind of narrative is, is as open as as artworks right in regards to what the viewer can get you know from it um, you know I mean I know they do occur that way but I think just generally kind of this mode of, of art making kind of has kind of proliferates maybe in a, in a different way than those things do well yeah. I just I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that um an artwork isn't fixed, so mm -hmm. anybody who steps up to it, and you do that when you read a, a book or you mm -hmm. listen to music, you do that as well, but there's a, a degree of it having potential with every different viewer right. that sees it and yeah. um, 
like you, you said, leaving these sort of suggestions or hints um, that put you in conversation as opposed to you telling somebody something you're mm -hmm. actually in conversation. The question about the drum, though, just this is so particular and, and kind of silly. I could ask you later, I guess, but I'm, I wonder if anybody else is wondering about the title on that first piece for Pace. Um, it says, what time is it? Oh, Creative Verbal what time is it? Yes. Yeah. What, can you tell me more about <laughs> what time it is? <laughs> Does anybody know what Creative Verbal what time is it? Is? Okay. Um, so, <laughs> Creative Verbal what time is it? Is, is a, um, it's a song by a group called X-Clan. And this was, again, like a late 80s, early 90s rap group that was um, out of Bedford-Stuyvesant. Uh, Brooklyn, right? Or the name of the Reverend Cyrus. It. Um, yeah, so I, I just, again, kind of that's what I was kind of uh, talking about earlier about like just these, these stackings of different kind of historical moments. Yeah, yeah, so that's what that is. So, so somebody steps up and doesn't know that and they make something else of it, and then at some point they cross paths with that information and like that comes back to them and makes a different kind of sense. It did, makes a different kind of sense, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, like, I do think there's a kind of, I do think I'm like a product of the, of the, of, of, of early hip hop, yeah. right? Like in terms of, um, yeah, just my creative process and yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, you were born about the time I was leaving high school, so yeah. there's a- Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So you contend with the, uh, you know, the value of the, the black archive to uh, been uh, you know, interested particularly in the, the video you show uh, because the gentleman was referencing how the FBI valued the culture enough to learn about the people to infiltrate. Right, right, right. right. As something valuable enough to infiltrate. And right. I'm, I'm interested in what you are finding as you, uh, you know, explore that black archive, which I'm very interested in because of the value of the people. Uh -huh. what, it, what are you finding that is uh, you know, valuable? Is it you know, unvaluable? Uh, what are you finding out as you explore those archives? And where are you explore those archives? Where, where stuff is actually stored and, and not seen, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in regards to, like I find a lot of stuff online, of course, um, I do do some, particularly in Houston, I do some, some research in, in local archives there. Um, uh, in terms of materials, eBay, what you call it, archive? What you call it? Yeah, yeah. So eBay. Um, uh, in terms of value, what, 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 what is the, the, the value that I find? Um, Particularly as your art now becomes part of the archive, right? It's, connect, it's connected to this, uh -huh. this this physical work that is now, you know. Yeah. What what's what's the value? I I, I think for me the the value um, that or the thing that that I usually take from from these um, kind of dives, you know, so in, into into the archive is just how. Um, omnipresent like that moment was because so, you know I really mainly look in the, the late 60s early 70s right and just how that was affecting so many levels of, of our of our culture right um, whether you talk about you know advertising or other elements of popular culture and um, it 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 tells me about the value of, of our you know of, of what we make you know, and honestly, I do think like that's one of the lessons that's within, you know, that I try to share and get other others to see. Um, because I, I don't feel the same kind of earnestness in the present moment in terms of what, you know, what gets produced and perhaps even the, the capability of it, you know, the potential of it. It's not the same, you know. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the things you know, and I and I, and I do struggle with that, and um, you know, because I have, I have two younger, I have a, a fifteen year old and a twelve year old, you know. So just kind of seeing the the culture that they're part of, and, and thinking about, 
you know, what was popular culture when I was young. You know, I, so yeah, it's just it just it's just kind of weird our evaluation of of then and now, and but trying not to be, you know, old fogey or, or, or romantic, you know, um, or nostalgic about it as as well. You know, yeah. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, but a very good question. Um, Okay. Well, I just had kind of a, a whimsical question. Why do you think the white population of New Orleans are so uh, threatened by a drop? Well, no, New Orleans was a place where it was allowed to exist one time a, a, a week. Well, not, well, not Other places in the South were totally not, not at all. Do you have any ideas about that? Like what? I mean, allegedly the idea is the drums use in rebellion and ritual, you know, that, that that's what was the, the threat, you know, and particularly thinking about the Haitian rebellion as a, as a model for that. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>